As I was putting this presentation together, one of the things I said is, you know, I need to figure out a little bit about Ohio. So I put Ohio in the Google and what came back, Urban Meyer, a Buckeye. And this uh, little uh, tidbit of information from Jeff Foxworthy. So I thought I'd share that with you to get started. <clears throat> so Jeff Foxworthy says, if your local Dairy Queen is closed from September through May, you may live in Ohio. <laughs> If someone in a Home Depot store offers you assistance and they don't even work there, you may live in Ohio. You may live in North Carolina, too. If you know several people who have hit a deer more than once, you may live in Ohio or North Carolina. If you switch from heat to AC in the same day and back again, you may live in Ohio. If you can drive 70 mile, miles an hour per, through two feet of snow during the raging blizzard without flinching, you may live in Ohio. Now, I can attest to that one because my first visit to Lima was in 2008, and it was in January. And I do want to thank Nicholas for having this conference in April and not January. Snow was up to here, and as you guys will find out in a little bit, I am from Florida. The plant's only, what, three to four miles from this facility? And I think it took me about a half an hour to get back here. And there was guys flying by me, giving me hand gestures. I won't tell you what those hand gestures were, but they were hand gestures. <laughs> so if you designed your kid's Halloween costume over a snowsuit, you may live in Ohio. <laughs> if driving is better in the winter because the potholes are filled with snow, you may live in Ohio. <laughs> if you know all four seasons, almost winter, winter, still winter, and road construction, you may live in Ohio. <laughs> if you have more miles on your snowblower than your car, you may live in Ohio. And the last one, if vacation means going anywhere south of Dayton for the weekend, you may live in Ohio. I thought those were great, and I uh, thought we'd start off with that. So a little bit of background as far as what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> Give you a little bit of overview about myself and Potash Corporation. We'll talk about the four pillars, and these four pillars are what have been successful for me as being a manager for the, for the last uh, uh, 20 years, which is aligning with business, basically having a plan, having structure and clear, clear communication. We'll talk about some challenges and trends, and I think one of the, the, uh, the conferences, uh, classes that I had earlier today was talking about cloud, and that's being one of them. <laughs> Then we'll open it up for questions and open discussion. So there are a few ground rules. I promise not to be boring and read from the slide. Well, I won't read from the slide. I can't tell you I won't be boring. <coughs> there will be a test at the end, so please take notes. <coughs> and please ask questions. I might not have the answer, um, but please ask the question anyways. <coughs> I'm just kidding on the test. I just wanted to see how many people were going to pick up a pencil and start writing stuff. But what I did decide to do, knowing it was after lunch and knowing you guys were going to be uh, kind of hungry, I thought, you know what, if I start losing you guys, what can I do? Has anybody uh, ever done the Macarena? <laughs> well, if you haven't, I've got a slideshow up here that's going to show you how to do it. So if I start losing you, I'm going to start playing the song. <laughs> No, what I am going to do is, well, I was going to do, but I couldn't find the sprinkler system, was this. <laughs> but I didn't think that would be too well, and Jeff couldn't find the, uh, the sprinkler system for me anyways. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up a military brat. My father did 20 years in the Air Force. <clears throat> uh, we moved around a lot. Uh, so uh, when I say moved around a lot, I was born in Denver, Colorado and we moved seven places before I turned 10. <clears throat> so you can just say that I, I'm, I'm okay with change. <clears throat> uh, wanted to follow my father's footsteps and join the career in the Air Force myself. So right out of high school, I went and, and uh, joined the Air Force. Wanted to follow his foot, footsteps and footpath and, and see the world, and they stuck me in Fort Campbell, Kentucky on an Army base. Not exactly what I was interested in doing in the Air Force. I did, 
My career was close air support, so I enjoyed that, um, but I didn't enjoy putting face paint on and going out in the woods. So after four years, I decided that, you know, it's time to go to college. <laughs> and uh, I knew I wanted to get into the computer field, um, but I didn't like programming. Uh, I wasn't a programmer, so I was trying to figure out what could I do. Computer science, that's all about programming, and then I found about an MIS degree, um, which was really more managing um, PCs, and that's the route I went. Uh, there was two schools that I was looking at. One was in South Florida, which is close to where my home was in Orlando, and the other was East Carolina, um, in, uh, in North Carolina, uh, which was close to where my parents were staying at the time. <clears throat> my wife says I picked East Carolina because the ratio of girls to guy was seven to one, but it wasn't. It was because it was a good university, and that's where I decided to go. So a little bit of background as far as my career. Uh, started with McLeod and Pullen right out of college. Um, basically accounting firm and did consulting work for them. Uh, after that, I worked for Warehouser Company, which is a paper and, um, and pulp uh, company. And then in 2000, I uh, started with Potash Corporation in White Springs, Florida, which is just west of Jacksonville um, at their facility. So a little bit of background as far as my experience. My first PC experience was a Tandy 1000. How many have played around with a Tandy 1000? This is the one that did not have a hard drive, just had the floppy. Buddy of mine would go there and write all the code so to see a guy would run across the screen. Yep, that was me. I didn't like the programming side again. I like putting the PC together. From there, my first PC was a 386SX, 40 meg hard drive, Windows 3.1. Uh, when I started with McLeod and Pullen, they were using Novell as their server platform. And I was eager just getting out of college, so my thought was, let me take my own path. So I went down the Windows Server route, and that's where I got my uh, MCSE <laughs> certification. This is, uh, again, a few years ago. And then uh, shortly after that, when I worked at uh, Potash Corporation, uh, had my MCSE, wanted to go down the route of networks, and that's when I got my CCMP, um, which I presently still have. So management skills, um, there's three books that I've actually read that I've used through my management skills. Uh, the first one is <clears throat> Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many have read this book? If you have not read this book, I highly recommend reading this book. This was a book that was given to me right when I got out of college with McLeod and Pullen. At the time, I was looking at it going, that's a thick-ass book. <laughs> But this book right here is the one book that I can tell you has meant more to me than any book that I've ever read. <laughs> Other books that have been good is Good to Great. How many have read this book? Get the Right Person on the Bus. That's the one thing that I got out of this. And the other one when I started getting to, from the technical side over to the management side was How Can I Easily Manage? So the first book that I grab is The One Minute Manager. And see how thin this one is? This is the one I like. These are the three books that I would say, if you haven't read them, that I highly recommend reading. So a little bit about, about, about Potash Corporation. We got 16 facilities throughout Canada, the US, and South America. <clears throat> Potash Corporation is the world's largest fertilizer producer by capacity. We're number one in potash and among the largest in nitrogen and phosphate. A little bit of background about potash. <clears throat> The, there are six facilities in Canada, five that are in Saskatchewan area, which is just north of Montana, and then one in New Brunswick, which is on the east side. We mine products 3,000 feet down, which is pretty impressive. Actually, about a couple years ago, I was able to, to go down one of those mines, and your, your ears do pop when you go down, just like when you go up in an airplane. <clears throat> Uh, the other th cool thing is, when I did get down there, I was with a guy that was able to turn off the lights, and I'll tell you one thing, that's the darkest you'll ever see it when you go down under there. Another quick tidbit about that is, it's 80 degrees year-round. It can be negative 30 up, up, uh, up the ground, but down low, it's 80 degrees. As far as the phosphate side, we have two mines that mine phosphate, one in eastern North Carolina, which is on the east side of Raleigh, near the water, and we have another facility in Florida that's just west of Jacksonville, and that's an above-ground mine. So we mine ore from the, uh, the ground there, above ground, 
and uh, extend that past where the chemical plants are for about 14, yeah, I guess about 14 miles is the farthest away from the plant. And then on the nitrogen side, you have one facility here in Lima. Uh, Jeff Johnson, I don't know if you know him, is here. Uh, that works out of the Lima facility. And we have three other nitrogen facilities in Augusta, Georgia, and Geismar, Louisiana, which is just west of New Orleans, and then Trinidad, which is in South America. Uh, and these are just a little bit of more information about the product itself. Basically, if you go to Home Depot and you pick up a fertilizer bag, you're going to see these three nutrients on that bag. As far as the phosphate side, if you open up, if you look on the side of a Coke can and you see phosphoric acid, that actually is a product that comes from our plant. So talk about a little bit about the goals as far as Potash Corporation. So Potash Corporation's goal is to be the gross margin leader and lowest cost supplier of potash into its key world market. We enhance our potash business with focusing on nitrogen and phosphate operations that leverage our unique strengths and emphasize stability. And here's our core values. And the reason why I'm bringing these two things up, they kind of they fall in line with the first pillar that, we're gonna, that I'm going to be speaking about. So the four pillars that I'm going to talk about are aligning with business, having a plan, structure, and clear communication. And basically, these are four pillars that if you do these things well, then you'll have a class gray A uh, management department. And these, these uh, pillars overline with each other. If you do just two of them right, the, ro the roof's not going not to hold. If you do three of them right, something happens, it's not going to fall over. So if you concentrate on these four pillars, I guarantee you you'll have a successful, successful IT. So talk about aligning IT with business. Are you aligned? You know, if, you, if you ask yourself that, are you aligned with the business? Uh, I found a video that I thought uh, kind of put it in a nutshell as far as what IT alignment is. When we get sick and visit a doctor, we leave with a prescription, a remedy, and instructions on how to administer the medication. The difference between remaining sick or regaining health is in the way we handle the remedy. Organizations are the same. Problems arise and solutions or remedies are implemented to fix them. The success or failure of the implementation is in the way it was managed or handled. How are you handling the remedy? In your organization, is business driving technology solutions? Or is technology driving business solutions? Organizations need to move from business driving technology solutions and from technology driving business solutions to arrive where business and technology are driving solutions simultaneously. This can only be achieved through alignment. In the business and technology jungle, alignment of people, processes, and best practices is essential to transform into tomorrow's organization. The success of the transformation lies in handling the remedy. You saw the author in that is uh, David Peterson. There is no relationship. <laughs> so how are you aligned today? you would ask that question. When I started at PCS, this was me, and I did a pretty good job of throwing airplanes. So I thought about it. Let me try to put something up there that will give you a better explanation of business IT alignment. Is that a little bit easier to follow? So do you even know your business strategy? I mean, again, we're IT geeks, right? We don't need to understand what the business is doing. We just need to put the technology out there. I bet you if you had that scenario, you'd probably want to know what your business strategy is, isn't it? So first, the question you need to ask yourself is, where are you today? So is IT perceived as cost of doing business? Is IT perceived as an asset? Are they seen as a competitive differentiator? 
or are they seen as a strategic weapon? I would say, to be honest, if I was looking internal right now, we're, we're basically emerging as an asset. I don't think our company is, uh, is looking at IT uh, right now. So I'll give you a quick example of bad uh, alignment. Uh, when I started it uh, at the facility in Florida, you know, I was still kind of green, new manager, wanted to please everybody, had a, had a low-end manager that came and asked to put in a compact IPAC. Does anybody know, familiar with the compact IPAC? That was back the, the, the buzz at the day as far as putting that in there. So let's buy 15 of these, give it to our guys out in the field and see them run with it. And again, me as an IT guy, I said, you know what, new technology, I'm run with this. So I went ahead and bought the 15, stuck them on the desktop, gave it to them, walked away. A couple months later, I go back and I'm looking in there and I see dust on the IPAX. And I asked the guy, I was like, are you guys even using this? And he goes, I don't know why the hell you even gave it to me. There wasn't any alignment as far as the business. There wasn't even any business case. He didn't even know why he had the IPAC on his desktop. And again, that's just where there's not alignment. I'll tell you a good alignment, and it happened a couple of years ago, and it was in a North Carolina facility. We we're trying to figure out how do we get data from the drag lines. I don't know if anybody has seen a drag line, but it's massive. And it's far away, like I was telling you before, it's up to 14 miles away from the plant. They needed to get data back. So we went into a room, we brought in engineers, we brought in operations, we brought in maintenance, brought in the general manager, we brought in IT, and we came together as a team and tried to figure out, okay, what is the ultimate end game of what we're trying to get to? And the end game was get the data back so we can analyze it. So you had the infrastructure as far as the IT side, you had the infrastructure you had to put on the drag line. So that's an example of aligning. You're aligning what your business is. You're aligning the technology with the, um, with the, uh, with the business. So how do you get there? So internally, you need to understand your company's mission statement. You need to understand their core values. If you don't understand what they're doing, again, you got to understand what they're doing before they're going to understand what you're doing. And you need to know the business. And for some of us, that's not exactly easy to do. For me, again, I'm an IT geek, right? And they're talking about fertilizer. They're talking about processes. It's not exactly easy for me to understand that. But for me to understand how I can better utilize the technology that I can give them, I need to understand the business. And external, you need to get a seat at the table. What I mean by that is when they're making decisions about the business, when they're making decisions about which direction they want to go, if you're not sitting at the table, how are you going to be able to help them leverage technology to be able to get to where they want to go as far as the business? So you need to work closely with the business. I know in some of your environments, you might not even have a direct report to the manager. I know in Jeff's case, he, worked, he, he reports to an accounting manager that in turn reports to the general manager. Now, I'm not saying in Jeff's case, it's not a scenario where he can't be at the seat of the table. He just needs to have good communication with the accounting manager so that they can talk about what the strategy are as far as the company. And the last one, again, you have to have a plan which lines into the second pillar. The funny thing about that cartoon character is that guy's pretty big. So I don't know if he needs any food anyways. So it goes into the second pillar, have a plan. Where are you going, how do you get there? You know the old statement, poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part? How many of you would love to say that to some guys walking into your office asking for a PC that, for a new guy that just came in? But you hold back. <laughs> So I had talked about this book that was the most instrumental book that I read, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and I thought it fit pretty well as far as having a plan. <clears throat> there are seven habits, and again, if you, haven't read, if you have read the book, you probably know what these habits are. If you haven't, I'm going to go over them briefly. So the first one is be proactive. Don't be somebody that's going to come into the office, do your work, and come home. The second one is going to be begin with end in mind, what ultimately you want to get to. When you're working with the business, you need to understand what, where they're wanting to go, what their direction is, and then you can help them get there. Put first things first. What does that mean? Does anybody know what put first things first means? 
highest priorities. And what usually is the case, most of the time, people are working on the easiest stuff, the stuff that can get done the quickest. You need to be put in the priority first. And then think win-win. Basically, win-win means, you know, we don't have to have a winner and a loser. You need to go down the road of planning and having a win-win situation. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Like I talked about as far as aligning the business, you need to understand the business before they're going to understand you. And then synergy. Synergy is basically the sum of the team is better than you by yourself. And then sharpen the saw, which is basically continuous improvement. So when talking about the first things first, this is uh, in the book, but it basically puts it in quadrants. And you guys have all seen this. If it's important, it's urgent, obviously you need to work on it. If it's important and not urgent, you still need to work on it because it is important, but it's not urgent and you don't need to jump around it right away. But most of the time, if you read the book, you'll notice that people are working on non-important, urgent stuff, and non-important and not urgent stuff. So is your plan aligned with the business? And like I said, like we did with the aligning of the business, we asked the question as far as have a plan, where are you today? I have no plan. I come in, I turn the computer on, I get the stuff done, and then I go home. I plan within the department. So my department knows what's going on. I got a plan. I got to make sure I got a disaster recovery plan. I got SOPs, but there isn't any alignment with the business. I plan with the business, and my plan is aligned with the business strategy. And obviously, the goal you want to get to is my plan is aligned with the business strategy. So question, how to get there? Again, you have to have a plan. Like I said before, the prior planning prevents piss poor performance, which is the six Ps, which is what I heard quite a few times when my father was in the military. I've even heard seven Ps, which is, uh, what is it? Uh, perfect prior plan. So basically you need to have a better plan than just, uh, just a plan itself. You need to develop your plan with business as a core. You need to plan with four core components. Plan, perform, measure, then improve. Everybody knows that plan's only as good as when you start it and then it starts changing. <clears throat> and you need to build the structure around the business, which goes into our third pillar. Are you built for success and align with the business? So the first question you need to ask yourself is, where are you today? I have a mess. I'm not sure where to begin. I'm working on building structure. I have structure, but not aligned with the business. I have structure, and it's aligned with the business. When I began with PCS in 2000, I'll tell you right now that mine was uh, the first one. I got a mess. I'm not sure where to begin. No documentation, no help desk, no SOPs, no mission statement. So how to get there? Get the right people on the bus. It comes right from good to great. If you don't have the right people on the bus, you're not going to get there. I'll give you one example, and it actually hits home here in Lima, and it's Jeff Johnston. Jeff, Jeff works at the Lima facility, and he's the right guy to get on the bus. Before him, we had somebody that didn't do planning, had no idea as far as alignment. Their structure was nowhere. They didn't have backup systems. <laughs> Jeff's come in. He's got good coordination with the business. He's got a plan as far as where he needs to go. That's what I'm talking about as far as have the right people on the bus. Have the right systems to support the business. You know, perfect example is the KISS. Have, have anybody heard the term KISS? Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> So basically what I mean by that is don't put systems in place that are not needed or required. If the business is not asking for it, you don't need to put it in. And I know that's hard for us IT geeks that we want to put new technology in, but if it does not align with the business, it doesn't need to go in. Develop structure to support the core business strategy. 
One example will be around data storage retention. Are you, have you built your structure around being able to make sure if the business says they need something up in four hours, that you have that up in four hours? Is your disaster recovery plan aligned with the business so that if something does fail, that you'll be able to get it back up in the way that the business wants it to? And then you communicate clear to the structure, which is our next um, pillar. So clear communication. Are you hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth? Does anybody know what movie that came from? Rush Hour. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? That is hilarious. I love that. Connor! Who, darling? You! Detective, you? Not you, you! Who? You! Who? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Don't nobody understand the words that are coming out of your mouth, man. <laughs> that was one of my all-time favorite movies. But it's, but it's pretty straightforward and simple, right? Clear communication is easy, right? What's so funny about that one is I have a 12-year-old would do that. You'll find as far as pod ass, safety is number one. And the joke here is I tell my guys that all the time when they go out to work, hey, don't get hurt. And if any of them did come back and get hurt, I'd be like, what happened? I told you not to get hurt. And again, I think that one's funny. So clear communication, not more communication. There is a huge difference. So one example that I have is around safety messages that we get with our company. We get like 9,000 safety messages a day. This is going back a while. And what does that end up happening when you get that many messages? It ends up being noise, right? Nobody's paying attention to it. There needs to be better and clearer communication for you to truly understand the message. So first, where are you today? As we asked about in alignment, as we asked about in planning. I need to work on communicating at all levels. That was where I was when I started at PCS. As pretty much a trend, you see that I was at the first level on all three of those. Communicate well in all directions. To communicate well in all directions, that's key. When I say that, it means you've got customers, you've got end users, you've got departments, you've got uh, managers. You know, do you have a clear understanding of what they got going on? Because communication is a two-way street. Do they understand what you got going on? When you take outages out <clears throat> and you say, you know what, Thursday night outages, we're going to take something down. Have you even reached out to the business to find out if that was a good time for them or was it just good for you so you can go watch Ohio State play football? <clears throat> so how to get there? What is the, basically the theme? You need to understand the business. Build a mission statement around business and communication. By show of hands, how many are IT managers out there? How many of you have a mission statement? I mean, how does your end users know who and what you can do and what you supply and what you actually be able to do unless you have that mission statement? I forget who I was talking about the other day. I actually, was, I might, who was that? Somebody was talking about that today. Well, they, call, they got called the other day asking to fix a microwave. Really? <laughs> I know you probably can't read this, but this is Potash Corp's mission statement, which includes the mission and values. And these need to line up with your business. If you don't have alignment there, it's not good as well. And again, you need to communicate in all directions. Got a couple quick stories <clears throat> as far as good alignment and bad alignment. How many still allow desktop printers on their desk? <clears throat> How many had them before and w was able to put in a policy to take them away? How many almost lost your life taking that printer away? <clears throat> 
I was, uh, I was new again when I was at PCS, just got there, and I knew the best practice, right? Put in good printers in core areas to be able to take desktop printers away. The ROI would go down, your help desk calls would go down. Every, everybody's a win-win, right? Until I put the plan in action. So I work with management, so I align with the business. I had the plan going as far as that side. They understood it, they loved it. You talk to management, you tell them you're gonna save money, they're like, go for it. So I put the plan together, bought the printers that I needed, put them in certain areas where I thought that they would go, built the structure around what I needed as far as where they're at. There was one piece of the pillar that I missed. Which piece do you think that was? Telling the users that I was gonna take their desktop printer. I had three pillars and that fourth one, that thing came rocket solid down on top of me. So I'm smart, right? Next time, that was when I was managing the White Springs facility. My next job was managing White Springs in Aurora. Went to Aurora, guess what happened? Run into the same scenario. Got 450 PCs that are sitting out there. We had like 450 desktop printers. I mean, like everybody had a desktop printer. Along that, we had network printers that were already in place. So I went down the same route, but this time I was looking at all four pillars. The first one, alignment. Talking to the business. This is the plan. This is the savings that we're going to have. The second route was, we're going to do the plan. Make sure that we're getting them in the right places. Built the structure as far as what printers we needed. And I did not miss the communication piece. I went to the users and asked, where do we need the desktop printer? I mean, where do we need the um, network printers? Where's the best place to put them? Do you need color? Do you need black and white? Once I did that, there wasn't any issues. I didn't get backstabbed. I didn't get there's IT coming in and doing their dictatorship again. Again, that, that, that level of all four was, uh, was huge. So let's pause. Am I, am I doing okay? Everybody out there, I don't see anybody falling asleep yet. A couple of you started closing your eyes a little bit. Are you still with me? Do we need to stand up? It's funny. I told my wife that I was going to do that. One, she didn't believe me, and she goes, you better make sure they don't make you dance. <laughs> so we talked about the four pillars. And I know this is a little dry, but I guarantee you, if you follow these four pillars, you're going to have a successful IT department. Align the business with IT. Have a plan. The whole six Ps. Build the structure around the plan. Disaster recovery. SOPs. Best practices. And then clearly communicate in all directions. I don't know how many times when I first started with PCS, I got frustrated they're putting in a new building. They're installing the electrical. They're installing the plumbing. They're installing everything. And what are the, what's the last thing they do? They reach out to IT and say, oh, by the way, we need outlets here when everybody's getting ready to move in. And then you ask, where are you going to put the network room? They didn't align for that. Where are you going to put the copier? They didn't align for that. And that goes back to the clear communications. You've got to be at the table in order to have that. So here's a few challenges and trends that I see in my, uh, in my field resources, aligning resources to request. So we did have a layoff about a year and a half ago, and it was a struggle because it was 10% pretty much throughout, which included the IT department. And what's the one struggle you have when you lose 10% throughout to include the IT? The business is being asked, as far as the users, to do more, right? And what are they going to do? They're going to come to IT and say, can you help me automate, improve, use new technology, which requires us to have more resources to be able to support them. So it's a, it's a crazy cycle as far as how do you get there. More reports was another challenge that we have. You know, people want to know the production. They want to know safety numbers. They want to know it today. And then you ask them, where's the data now? And what's the first thing they say in an Excel spreadsheet? I don't know about you, but this IT guy hates Excel spreadsheets. 
being mobile. So in our environment, again, we've got 16 facilities. We're pretty spread out. I'm over six sites and assist managing the nitrogen side, which is another four sites. So that's 10 sites. That's just myself. We've got safety managers. We've got operations managers that are supporting multiple sites. It's just pushing their offices further out. So obviously it's a challenge to try to be able to support that. And how many have heard this? If it's, if it's got an IP, it belongs to IT. That joke about the microwave, ask Cisco. It won't be too long before we're going to be supporting microwaves. <clears throat> Proactive versus reactive. Again, the whole, the whole scenario of I can't get anything done as far as proactive because all I'm doing is fighting the fires. And the only thing that I can tell you as far as that one that would be a benefit, because I got a guy <clears throat> at one of my facilities, the guy will run through a wall for you. The guy will work 20 hours a day for you, seven days a week without a question. But the guy doesn't stop and slow down and pause to find out that, you know what, if you had to just patch that McAfee server, you won't be running around fixing that PC every day. So there's that balancing act that you have to work on being proactive versus reactive. And we've got a new slogan out right now, and it's around safety but we need to use it around IT. It's called 20-20-20. So every 20 minutes, you pause for 20 seconds and you look 20 feet around. You can use that same analogy when it comes to proactive versus reactive. Pause and look at what's going on. What do you need to do to start getting into the proactive state? Because once you start getting into the proactive state, your help test numbers go down. Your problems go down. Some strategies that I don't have an answer to right now is around mobility, supporting mobility. Use an Android, use an Apple. How do you manage them? If you guys have the answer after this, please come up and tell me. Data storage, do you do data storage local? Do you do, do, you do cloud? Email, that one's crazy on our side. How do you support an email server? I'm talking about just the data. I'm talking about taking somebody's desktop printer away from them? If you limit somebody's quota on their email, that's almost as bad. I don't, have a, I don't have an answer to that. Some quick trends. And I think one of the sessions this morning uh, was that Walter uh, was talking about that as far as cloud. When I first uh, got into the business, you know, cloud was a dirty word to me. Don't take something away from me if I got the resources to support it. Plus, in each of the environments that I've been in, they've been manufacturing environments. You lose that connection from wherever you're going, and you lose productivity. But to be honest with you, I'm actually leaning toward looking at cloud a little bit more. We had an incident as far as a hurricane in North Carolina just a couple years ago where we lost power to the facility. So we had our computer room. We had to shut down certain operations. But the WAN link and the firewall and the connection to the Internet were up. In that case, if we had a cloud solution, we wouldn't have had to worry about turning things off. So again, I'm, I'm looking at that from a different, and I just see that, um, you know, moving. Mobility, again, people are wanting to be more mobile, especially even our environment, even when we're manufacturing. And then data. Again, data is pretty easy to gather now. At NAS, different types of storage that you could have local, you got cloud storage. And then virtual, obviously VMware, Hyper-V, cloud. So with that, I know it was probably a little bit boring as far as the data, but to recap, you got four pillars. And if you can be successful in those four pillars, I guarantee you'll have a successful managed IT department. With that, any questions? See, so we've looked at um, What's Up Gold, and uh, solar winds, and we actually have what's up gold at our facility. Um, it's it's a product that it, it, when we did the analysis, one from a cost standpoint, um, was better for us. You know, solar wind does it on a per port base, and what's up gold does it on a per device base, um, and it integrated well within our environment. So that's what we chose um, as far as and doing that, and it'll do both servers and network. And we also have System Center. We're using the System Center platform. 
So we're using that and we're getting ready to implement. I know Microsoft just changed their licensing. We used to have just uh, system center content management, um, but because of the new licensing structure, you've got operations monitor, so we're going to be implementing that as well to help us support the server environment. I appreciate you answering the asking the question first. I got three books up here. I don't know which one that if you, uh, if you read or if you're interested in one, but I got a book for you. Which one? Seven Habits. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, two more questions. I appreciate the time. Again, I apologize if it was a little boring. I'm an introverted guy. I'm not an extroverted guy. I tried to put a little content in there to make you laugh a little bit. Uh, I will be here afterwards. Please come and see me. One of the things that I, uh, I feel like has also helped me progress in the, in the path that I have is around collaboration and, uh, and synergy with other plants. The re reason why I feel like that I was able to get over Aurora and White Springs at the time is because I had a good relationship with the Aurora manager on the IT side. I do have a LinkedIn account. Feel free to, to jump in. I think it's uh, G. Peterson LinkedIn. So if you have any, hey, I heard you talking about this or I'm having that, please jump in and, and shoot it my way. Uh, I'm not on there as much as I should, uh, but uh, if, if you do ping me, I'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely reply. So again, I appreciate your time.